You know, no matter how hard we try to make everything digital, the world really is still analog. Those ears you're using to listen to this here chalk talk, totally analog. That goes with your eyes, too. In fact, we do not have a single digital sense. Not our fingers, our nose, heck, I'd hate to taste digitally flavored food. So we're running about zero for five on this one. And for all those times we need to get stuff into the digital domain so we can do our fancy processing, we need analog to digital converters, ADCs. You know, to convert all those nice, smooth, wavy analog things into crunchy, square digital things. But what happens when the analog stuff we're really after is super fast? Faster than normal analog to digital converters can handle. Stuff like radar or scientific equipment or perhaps the latest high-speed wireless? Hmm? Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. When we need to work with really fast analog signals, we need really fast ADCs. My guest today is Trent Butcher from Microchip, and we're going to talk about how to address the challenges of high-speed analog-to-digital conversion. Before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find out more information about Microchip's high-speed analog-to-digital conversion solutions. Hi, Trent. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, good to be with you. So Trent, it's an analog world out there, and as nice as it is to work in the digital domain, we've got to move from analog to digital first, right? And sometimes the analog stuff we're interested in is moving pretty fast. That's correct. What kind of applications are we talking about today? Well, since today we're focusing on high-speed signal acquisition, the area of the chart here that we're looking at, that we're going to focus on, is over on the right in the really high speed area. So applications such as communications, test equipment, software defined radios, et cetera. Those are the applications that are really driving high speed signal acquisition. Obviously there's a lot of other applications out there that require analog to digital conversion, but these are the ones that are driving the high speed acquisition. So what are some of the things we need to think about in the analog to digital part of these high speed applications? When it comes to looking at various concerns or considerations that you have in your design, obviously accuracy is one of the first things you look at. How accurate do you need to be measuring the signal? So some things to look at in terms of accuracy, obviously your your noise, harmonics, what's your gain and offset. What kind of environmental changes do you have? Changes over time, changes in temperature, and of course, how fast is the signal that you're monitoring? What kind of bandwidth do you actually need In addition to that, you have concerns in terms of system architecture, like how big is your application? What's the size that you have to squeeze all this into? How are you interfacing to other blocks in your application? And what type of post-processing do you need to do with your data? And of course, above all, everyone's always concerned about how much power you're using. Okay, so Trent, you mentioned accuracy first. Let's talk about that a little bit more. Great. Well, one of the first specifications that you'll always see on an A to D converter is the resolution. But the resolution really only tells you the number of data output bits you get, not necessarily what the true accuracy is. So to really get a good picture of the accuracy, we need to look at a few other specifications. One of the first ones that we look at is a signal to noise ratio. We can see on the graph and you know, that's really a measure of what the overall system noise is in the system that we have. Spurious free dynamic range is another one that we look at where we're looking at the distance down to the highest level spur. It gives us kind of a measure of what the distortion is. And of course, we want to measure all the distortion that's involved. Very similar, kind of this cousin to the spurious free dynamic range is the total harmonic distortion. And you can see that here on the graph. And of course, we always want to look at what is our overall noise floor. Of course, other specifications are important, and depending on your application, you may be interested in some more than another. But these are some of the specifications we'll look at for the high-speed signal acquisition applications. Okay, Trent, so how do you actually achieve this accuracy? What kind of steps are we talking about here? Well, the way to achieve it, obviously you have to start with a great part that has a great design and good accuracy. There are some things that you, as a user, would want to use and in order to be able to control the accuracy that you're monitoring. Gain, offset, phase, or something that you can easily correct with the parts. 
Calibration is something that can go on in the background. Obviously, there's an initial calibration that goes on. We'll take in some initial values and compensate for any settings, any environmental changes that are going on. And having a continuous background calibration helps to be able to track changes in environment and temperature and maybe even the part and system over time. Okay, so now there is a relationship between the bandwidth we want and the sampling rate we need, isn't there? Absolutely. Obviously, we need to sample the signal fast enough to be able to acquire and get all the information we need out of it. So let's take a look at the relationship here between sampling rate and what kind of bandwidth we need. We'll go for a typical sampling rate, say 200 mega samples per second. Typically, the input bandwidth, or the signal that we want to measure, needs to be at least 50% of that rate, according to our famous Nyquist theorem. And you can see on the chart, our FS, our sampling frequency, is shown there. And as long as our signal is listed less than half of that, then we'll acquire it and be able to capture all of the frequency data that we need. Now, there's another thing that is often done, and that's called undersampling. Undersampling is possible as long as the signal is inside what we call the input channel bandwidth. So here's the way that works. So in this particular example, we're sampling at 200 mega samples per second. A typical input channel bandwidth for that type of device would be five to 650 megahertz. So let's say I have an input signal that is actually higher than my sampling frequency. Uh, therefore, I'd have to be undersampling. As long as that signal is less than my input bandwidth, then I can take a bandpass filter and basically remove everything outside of the signal that I'm measuring and then go ahead and sample at, even at the lower sample rate, and it will show up inside the bandwidth of interest. But knowing more or less at what frequency my signal is, I can go ahead and capture that and acquire all the information that I need from that signal. Now we've acquired these fast signals. How do we get the data out? That's a good question. So when it comes to getting data out, obviously these signals are acquired extremely fast, and we need to get all that data out to the rest of the system. So a couple different interface options, and a lot of that depends on the speed at which you're acquiring the data. If your interface is around 100 megahertz or less, CMOS is usually a good option, simply because it's very simple to use, it's not very complex, and it really uses a lot less power than other options. LVDS is another option that's available. It's typically required for speeds above 100 megahertz, and it does require less pins than CMOS. There are other options out there for even faster, such as the JSD 204 b interface, but that's really for speeds that are beyond even what we're talking about here. All right, so we've collected the data and sent it out, and you said earlier we need to do some post-processing on it. Is, is that right? Yeah, many applications will want to do some sort of post-processing. So let's say in your application, you want to be able to do some functions, say decimation, where once you've acquired the signal, you want to be able to reduce the noise floor. Decimation is one way to be able to do that. We can reduce our noise floor every time we apply a decimation filter by about 2 to 3 dB every time. In this example here, I've acquired a signal at 200 mega samples per second. So you can see the bandwidth here on the chart is up to 100 megahertz. Now if I were to apply a single decimation filter, the filter is then applied, which then reduces all the noise above that. And now with basically half of the noise being rejected from my signal, I then apply the decimation, which is really taking every other sample and then doing that with half the noise removed from the signal. So now with the decimated signal, I have more or less half the noise from what I started with. So half the noise ends up being about two to three dB. As long as the decimation does not remove the signal that's actually acquired, then this works great for lowering my noise floor. Okay, so Trent, can you give me an example about where you would use post-processing and, and where it would be advantageous? Sure. So let's take a look at this particular example. This is a RF receiving system. You can see in here the RF signals coming in. I'm applying a number of analog functions to it. And in particular, I'd like to focus on the part that's in the block there. A lot of times this is done in a very analog fashion. And while this is great and it's been done this way in the past, there are a lot of places where noise and other errors can creep into the system, as shown at the bottom. For example, clock jitter can influence the system in various different locations there. There's lots of places where power consumption is quite high and various tolerances and mismatches can occur because of differences in components in the system. 
doing this the straight standard analog way has been great in the past, but there are other alternatives available that would allow you to remove a lot of those errors as well as lower the overall power consumption. So one additional post-processing function that can be used in this case to remove a lot of that, basically do a post-processing on the chip, is the digital down converter. Now with the digital down converter, we're mixing in a numerically controlled oscillator and then applying a low pass filter and decimation to get my INQ data. Now doing this digitally removes the possibility of multiple noise sources, clock jitters, and reduces overall system complexity. Because this functionality is now integrated into my A to D converter. And in addition to that, this being a fixed function state machine, it lowers the overall power usage. So to apply this type of functionality in an FPGA, even done digitally in an FPGA, would use about four times the power than what this system does here, having this functionality integrated. So what other kind of post-processing can we do? Well, I've got another great example for you here. This is something that's done is another way of reducing noise inside your system, at least lowering the noise floor around a particular bandwidth of interest. We call that our noise shaping requantizer. It's a fancy name for something that I wish we had for little children, hopefully in the Star Trek age. Yes, I have a baby that needs a noise <laughs> shaping requantizer. <laughs> Excellent. Maybe someday we'll have one for them. In the meantime, we're stuck with this type of post-processing technique. The way this works is every time a signal is digitized, there's a quantization noise that is available and it's spread through the entire spectrum. And what this noise shaping requantizer does is it takes the noise and spreads it out away from a bandwidth of interest. So in many of the devices by microchip where this is available, you can select the filter, the bandwidth that you want the noise removed from, and that noise will then get pushed away so that around your input signal and a particular bandwidth of interest, that noise will be removed and you will have a near perfect acquisition of your signal. Okay, so Trent, what if I have more than one channel I want to measure? That's great. Obviously, you can use more than one A to D. Another option is to use a multiplexer, and many of the devices from Microchip have up to an eight channel multiplexer that allow you to be able to select the channel order. Now, one of the downsides of using a multiplexer is that the samples are acquired in a round robin fashion where each channel is sampled one at a time. Now, what this does is the channels are not sampled simultaneously, but due to some additional post-processing functions that are available, such as this fractional delay recovery, this particular post-processing function will de-skew the samples between the channels, thus synthetically removing the delay. So it would have the appearance as though the data coming through is sampled simultaneously. All right, Trent, let's talk about power. How hot do these babies get? All right, these parts actually are quite low power. In fact, they're so low power you can touch them without gloves. Even with your bare fingers, you can touch them while they're fully running have some power numbers here. You can see the power from the 16-bit parts, which obviously you typically need a little more power to get that extra accuracy out of the devices. And we have some lower power versions that are 14 and 12-bit. Okay, Trent, I'm ready to get my hands dirty. Where do we go from here? All right, well, there's an easy little setup that you can use. There's an analog digital converter board along with the data capture card that takes the data and sends it to your computer. A little setup that we have showing here shows a signal source going through a filter so that you are only measuring the signal that you want to measure without any additional harmonics. And that little setup there will send the data to your laptop through a graphical user interface where you can monitor functionality of the devices that are available, check out the performance, look at the different post-processing features that are available on there, and send the data to your laptop for further evaluation. Excellent. Sounds great. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Trent. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And before we go, don't forget to click that link. There you can find out more information about high-speed analog-to-digital conversion from Microchip. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton. For more Chalk Talks, check out the EE Journal YouTube channel or the on-demand section of eejournal.com. 